So start with a chant. Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Vunaktu, Sahavir Yam Karavavahai, Tejasvinavati Tamastu, Mahavit Vishavahai, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Om, may Brahman protect us, may he guide us, may he give us strength and right understanding. May love and harmony be with us all. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us all. Good morning. Thanks for coming in this gorgeous spring day. You know, when they asked me, um, okay, what's your topic for this month? The words came out of my mouth even before I really knew what I was going to say. I said, living with uncertainty. So I guess I'd been thinking about it for a while. (laughs) Kind of a relevant topic around here. Um, But considering what's going on in the community, it's, it's really not too surprising because we've all been living with a great deal of uncertainty. Uh, what's interesting is that we're all surprised by the uncertainty we're living with, but in fact, we live with uncertainty all the time. We just don't want to acknowledge it because it's uncomfortable. We don't let it come up to our conscious mind, but it's lurking there underneath the surface like those sharks that are swimming right below us with their teeth out. And I think when we don't acknowledge it, I think it gives us this kind of low-level anxiety. And I think it gives us the sense that we have to, you know, be in control of everything. Because um, we feel this kind of undefined anxiety about being out of control and having these things that were uncertain happening. So despite our knowledge to the contrary that things always happen, um, the unexpected always does happen uncertainty always does happen. But the fact is we never really expect the unexpected as often as that happens. No one leaves the house in the morning expecting to get into a car accident. Oh, today's the day I get T-boned. I knew it was going to happen. You don't, we don't expect to leave the house and have that be the, the day you come back to a house fire. We don't expect to go to work that day, and when we're there hearing our, or that, that uh, you know, we slip and fall and, and break a bone in our body. No one ever expects that, but it happens. No one expects the house fire. No one expects to be dumped by their loved ones. No one expects to be downsized from a job. But it happens, and when it happens, it takes us by surprise. And when these things do happen, as they inevitably will happen one day or another, we're always shocked and we're, we're surprised by it, and it seems so unfair. But life is inherently uncertain. But we put blinders on and assume that everything is going to continue pretty much the way they have been unless they kind of go up on this nice little upward trajectory and things get better and better and that's okay. We don't like it if it goes the other direction. And all these things have been kind of brought very much home to us with all these disasters that we've had around here. The fires and the mudslides and the devastation everywhere. Uh, we were, of course, prepared for the fire. We were really prepared for the fire. We live in a fire danger area, so we know what it's like. I mean, we we all had a vet during fire season. We have our bags packed, ready to go. We all know what cars we're going in. We've got instructions how to evacuate the temple, how to evacuate the shrine, Uh, uh, getting the animals out, which car the animals. I mean, we've got this down to a science. We have our evacuation plans. We know whose house we're going to. Click, we did that right. No one expected the mudslides. No one expected. And all that in its wake left such insecurity and this feeling of unsafety, like, what's, what's going to happen now? What's, what's going to happen? It, it left the ground kind of loose underneath our feet. But the very nature of life is that life itself is uncertain. We don't live in a cocoon. The very nature of walking out our door in the morning is uncertain. We don't know when that manhole cover is going to be up. We don't know what life is going to bring us. Life is unsafe. We want our friends to be unsafe. We want ourselves to be unsafe. We want the places we love to be unsafe. But we don't live in that cocoon that we want to live in. 
You know, we often give classes here in the temple to high schools and colleges. And one of the things we often discuss is what is in the Hindu or Vedanta tradition, what is real and what is unreal. Well, in the ultimate sense, that which is unreal is that which changes, that which is transitory. And what is real is that which never changes, that which is eternal. So for example, for as an example, I'd say, well, for example, my body is temporary. It's going to go. I'm getting these little signals here. It's going to go, and so my body is not ultimately real. The mind will go. That is not ultimately real. And I said, the trees are going to go. They're eventually going to go. And even the temple one day will fall down. I said, and one, even the mountains will crumble. And it's like, but I didn't mean now. <laughs> Please, please. I was, I was, I was speaking theoretically. So no one, no one kind of expects that, but it happens. We live in a land of earthquakes. No one really expects to wake up that day and have it's going to be an earthquake day, even though it happened last Thursday. We keep hearing about, you know, we're in California. You always talk about the big one, the big one. We don't know when it will hit. We don't know where it will hit. We don't if it will hit. But we all keep hearing about the big one. But we know one day something is going to happen somewhere. We know that our body had a beginning, and we know that one day it will go. And yet somehow no one expects that it's going to happen to them. Even though we get these signals from the God of death, Yama, okay, I'm sending you these little postcards that things are kind of moving on in your life. Notice the wrinkles, notice the hair, you know, things are... Our family, our friends, some of our family passes away, even our friends pass away. We talk about God old people, like it's not us. <laughs> this is what we, but we somehow don't think we'll ever be us, because we think that we're eternal, which in the ultimate sense, of course, we are. We can't imagine our own death, but one day it will happen. We just don't know where, we don't know when. The nature of life is uncertain, but yet we somehow pretend that it, it is pretty much certain, and it goes along in a certain way until we're, we're unhappily surprised. Life is fragile. It's like water on a lotus leaf, they say. Well, that means that we have a short time in our existence is here for just a short time. But the truth is it can end at any second. All we need is to have one good illness and we feel how close it is to us. We know that our existence can end at any second and we know this intellectually. We all agree, we all know this but we refuse to really inhabit the ideal, let alone assimilate it, let alone assimilate the idea that this thing will all come to an end and that we have to live with the uncertainty that we're living with every day. We can't avoid uncertainty and we can't avoid the changes that life brings us, whether we like those changes or not. But instead of running from it, we have to face it, or as Swami Vivekananda would love to say, face the brute, face the uncertainty, and learn what it can teach us. It was quite interesting. Did you know, in 2001, scientists at UCSB put out this, published a report, and in this report they said, the next big one in Santa Barbara may not be an earthquake, but a boulder-carrying flood. 2001, they published that. It gets better. It also said this flood would most likely occur, I'm quoting here, every few thousand years. Bingo! We got the ticket! We got the winning ticket! A one in 3,000 chance. We won it. Bingo! Now, no one objects to a one in 3,000 check chance if it's the lottery. But no, we didn't get the lottery. We got instead the debris flow, which upended the world here. We got it so everybody was, was the, the community was eviscerated, everybody was PTSD, including the dogs. The, <laughs> the, the whole community was just turned up upside down, and it'll take decades to really recover. That is the ticket we pulled. So rather than having it feel like it was some sort of a cosmic mistake or that there was some sort of divine distribution error, this is Santa Barbara, we don't do that. 
we like perfection in Santa Barbara. No, we can't, rather than denying it or said it shouldn't have happened, we need to own it and we need to learn from it and see what this has to teach us. The truth is we never know what card we've pulled and what card we're going to have, we, we're going to be playing with. It might be debris flow and mudslides. It might be an upcoming fantastic job that we haven't even thought about. It might be your kid calling from school with a broken leg. Or it might be a long lost relative knocking on your door demanding dinner. You're who? What? We don't know. All we know is that the unexpected will happen for good and for ill. The problem with it is that things being unpredictable is that human beings are generally not happy with uncertainty. It makes us nervous. In fact, it gives us real stress. And they say some of our greatest stress is being in this position of uncertainty. Will I keep my job or will I be downsized? Am I, uh, is my business going to make it or is it going to fail? Is my partner staying? Is my spouse leaving me? I don't know. Will I have enough money for retirement or am I going to be one of those people living in an RV? Am I, am, am, am I, is my health going to be okay? Am I going to have money to stay with me the rest of my life? Are my children going to stand by me or are they going to ditch me? Am I going to end up being warehoused in one of those nursing homes? None of us know. None of us know the future and that makes us very uncomfortable. Is that mountain going to come down? None of us know. We can't avoid uncertainty, but what we can do is try to minimize the stress and the feelings of fear that come with uncertainty. Now, one of the most stressful situations for human beings is the feeling of being out of control. In fact, the board of cardiologists have done great studies on this because it affects the heart so profoundly. It's interesting. Cardiologists say and I've read this, that the body responds to feelings of being out of control the way that we respond to extremely stressful events like being pursued by a mastodon or saber-toothed tiger. It really shoots our body. It increases the amount of stress hormones throughout our body. It uh, pours out inflammation into our body. It increases the heart rate. It gives us an irregular heartbeat and it increases our blood pressure all with the sense of us being out of control. Human beings hate to be out of control. But the problem is, we're never in control. We never have been, we never will be, we never can be. Because we can't control the future. We can't control the universe. We want to determine our future because we want maximum joy and minimum pain. So we want to be able to have the option of being able to move things around so that will happen for us. But the problem is, it doesn't happen that way, and it's good. Because having maximum pleasure and minimum pain is no way to learn, it's no way to grow, and it's no way to gain a deeper sense of what life is about. It's no way to understand what the meaning of life is. So rather than fighting it, rather than thinking that we can be in control on all the time and thinking that life ought to just listen to us and we'll tell it what to do, we need to get comfortable with the fact that we don't have control. We need to let go of the illusion of control because we never had control in the first place. And when we do that, we can kind of take a step back and look at the big picture and say, you know, it's all going to be okay. No matter what happens, it is all going to be okay. Instead, instead of avoiding uncertainty or trying to pretend that it doesn't exist, we need to actually face it, <coughs> excuse me, and to sort of become friends with it, be pals with uncertainty. And, and otherwise, if we don't, if we avoid it, if we pretend that's not there, we'll end, excuse me, <coughs> If we don't face it and become friends with it, <coughs> we'll live and die in fear. And that's no way to live or die. 
we have to, you know, be here happily on the planet. <coughs> Excuse me. Living consciously with uncertainty gives us an understanding that life is precarious, and because it's precarious, it's really very precious. It's fleeting, it's fragile, and because it's fragile and fleeting, <coughs> it's beautiful and it's precious. We can't hold on to anything. We can't stay the hand of time. <coughs> I don't know what I did. <coughs> people, people will often say, I wish I could hang on to, I could hold on to this moment forever. It's like, no you don't. No, you really don't. It'd be boring. Second of all, you can't. None of us can. We can't stay the hand of time. Swami Asheshinandi at Portland never tired of repeating the saying of Buddha, all compounded matter is bound to decay. We can't hold on to it. You know, we want to hold on to life, hold it in our grips so nothing changes. What we like, we want to hold on to it. We want to hold on to it the way that they catch butterflies. They catch them and they pin them and put them into a frame. You know, butterfly's dead. And the beauty was in its life. And the way that it just went through. The butterfly goes through. That was the, the, Its beauty is there and it's fleeting. We have to let it go. Enjoy it and just let it go. That is the beauty of really appreciating how uncertain life is. We can't hold on to anything. Neither our life, nor our possessions, nor our homes, nor our friends, nor our kids, our pets, our money, anything. We can't hold on to anything. Like butterflies, these things grace our life, and then they move on, as do we. Sri Ramakrishna said, everything appears and disappears by the will of God. Appears and disappears by the will of God. And when we really get that, we'll have some sense of peace and a sense of a deeper understanding of how the world works. We realize that life isn't happening to us. It's happening for us. When we accept that, we can gain a greater understanding of ourselves and others and, the, and what we need to learn from life. When we learn to live with certainty, with uncertainty, consciously doing so, not doing it unconsciously with blinkers on, we see more clearly and then we begin to lose our fear. We begin to understand what's really important. When we realize how fleeting life is, we become grateful. We become grateful for that butterfly that just went through our life. We become grateful for all these experiences that we have that we know are transitory. We, are, we don't hold our happiness into the things that we insist that they have to be here now, they have to be here in the future, or else I won't be happy. We put our, we don't hold the bar that high for our happiness. We don't hold that many expectations about what we need to be happy. We just say, thank you, thank you. I know this will not last forever. This makes it all the more precious and all the more beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. This is what life teaches us when we realize how, unster how uncertain, how unstable it all is. We depend less. When we realize how fleeting life is, how uncertain everything is, we learn to depend less on external factors for our happiness. And the less that we can depend on external factors to make us happy, the happier we're going to be. Because the more expectations and demands that we make about what we need to be happy, about what we need to have, the more bondage we have. Every bit of bondage brings us pain. And the worst bondage that we can give ourselves is the bondage of expectations. What should be happening. And this is the greatest pain that we can give ourselves, and we do it to ourselves. We do it. Our expectations bring us this misery. We have to let them go. Life doesn't work like that. When we learn to live with uncertainty, consciously doing so, 
we end up asking ourselves the questions we should have been asking all along. What am I doing with my life? How am I using my time? Am I using my time well, or am I kind of wasting my time? Am I kind of floating along on the surface of life, enjoying just having a great old time? The problem with that, and it's fun while it lasts, I know, I know. It's fun while it lasts. The problem with that is that it ends so suddenly. We don't, have, we don't get notice. It ends. And then we realize that we haven't done the journey that we wanted to do. We haven't put our time into our spiritual life. We haven't done a lot in our inner world that we wanted to do. And we won't get that opportunity again. That's why we can't just float along on the surface of life. That's why when we're given this opportunity of uncertainty, we can ask ourselves, what, what, am, I, what am I doing here? What is the purpose? What is my role in life? What is my purpose in life? What do I want to do with my life? Am I using my time in the way that really helps me towards my goal? Am I fulfilling the life that I want to lead? Or am I actually wanting to do something else but never just got around to it? Because we never know when the curtain drops. Now one thing Vedanta is really clear about is that there's the only purpose of life, the greatest purpose in life, is to realize God to manifest the innate divinity within us. That is our goal in life. Now we can do that through the path of love, through loving God. We can do that through the path of service and unselfish, unselfish work. We can do that through sort of discernment about what is real and what is, what is unlasting. We can do that through deep meditation. But unless we put time and effort into our spiritual life, into our spiritual life now, we won't get the happiness that we all want. That's all we want. We all just want to be happy. We just want a peaceful, contented life. We want some happiness. But unless we do some work on that, we won't have the happiness we want. The uh, happiness that we seek, of course, as we all know, is within ourselves. The Buddha said, Oh, nobly born, remember who you are. Oh, nobly born, remember who you are. You know, if we could say that to ourselves like 20,000 times a day, it, you know, we'd be in really good shape. We'd, we'd really have a lot of good things going in our life, but we could just remember that. Remember who you are. Who are we? We are infinite spirit. We are unborn, we are dying, we are absolutely free. Infinite, infinite knowledge, wisdom, and radiance lives within our own hearts. Remember who you are. Don't think that we're small, puny creatures at the mercy of silly mountains. We're the infinite. Infinite strength is within us. Infinite purity and power with us in us. Yes, infinite strength, purity, and power is all within us. We simply have to access it. But we can't access it unless we put the time into having some practice so that we can access it. It's there for us all the time. We simply have to remove the impurities in our mind. And then it's there for us forever, for all time. This requires practice. And the practice is all about the three Ps that Swami Vivekananda never tired of speaking of. And that's patience, Purity and perseverance. Patience because it doesn't come in a day. Purity because we have to be really clean with our understanding. We can't delude ourselves or other people what we're up to. We can't lie, cheat, steal, go around like a tomcat and, and say that I have a great spiritual life because I sit down and meditate for 20 minutes a day. That doesn't cut it. It just means you're rowing a boat with holes in it. Ethical life is absolutely necessary for our practice. And perseverance, because it's day after day, week after week, month after month. But the good thing is that it gets easier, it gets better, and it gets to the point that unless you do it, you don't feel, you don't, if you feel like you're walking around without your teeth being brushed, it becomes a part of who you are. 
and it becomes the only way to live in the world. So if we have this in place, we can't take a wrong step. Living with uncertainty allows us to take obstacles and to make them into opportunities. But it doesn't happen by itself. We actually have to change our mind to be able to accept what was obstacle and make it into an opportunity. So when something happens, when something happens that we think is bad, we can either think of ourselves as victims, which just makes us weak and blames other people. It's like, get over it. Either think of ourselves as victims or we can sit down really quietly and say, what can I learn from this? What can I learn from this situation? Rather than ratcheting the blame, rather than, say, rather than weakening myself, what can I learn from this? How will this give me greater strength and understanding? If we can turn down the chatter in our head, we can turn from what was scary and what was bad into a situation where we gain more in love and compassion and more spiritual understanding. When, we, when this happens, we really gain a greater understanding about our own life, our place in the world, and about we really begin to understand about what matters and you know what really doesn't matter. That's what we gain. So what do we do on a very practical level when these difficulties arise, when we're placed in these sort of situations that we never expected. The first thing that we say, we ask ourselves is, okay, what in this situation can I control here? Okay, which leads us to point number two, which is let's, mm, very little. There's very little that you can do here to control. We can't control the future. We can't control other people. We can't control nature. We can control our own minds. We can control the thoughts in our minds. We can control our reactions. We just have some practice. We need to practice doing it. The other thing that we should think about is that I never knew this. You may have heard of it. You may not. Did you know that the average human being thinks 50,000 to 70,000 thoughts every day? Isn't that exhausting? 50,000 to 70,000 thoughts every day, and most of them, or a large amount of them, were the same ones as they were the day before, and 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 the day before. It's, oh my God. 50 to 70,000. This gives us 50 to 70,000 opportunities to change what we think every day. A lot of what we think is unhelpful. It's negative. It brings us fear. A lot of the times it's um, attacking someone else, we're attacking ourselves. Basically unhelpful. It's self, they're often self-defeating. They're often, we're often cutting ourselves off at the knees. 50,000 to 70,000 chances every day to make a difference, which means putting good positive, noble thoughts in our minds. Oh, nobly born, remember who you are. If we can think that, that's fantastic. Change what we think every day. That's something we can do. We have so many chances every day. We have to watch the mind and see what we're filling our minds with. That's all we have to do. Rather than just kind of assuming it's going to go on its own thing, we have the power to look at it and see what it is doing, the little rascal see what it's thinking and say, oh, are you really thinking that? Oh, you thought that yesterday too. Let's do this a little differently. Why don't we think something else? Why don't we think, oh, nobly born, remember who you are? Why don't we think of what Swami Vivekananda said? He said this to the Parliament of Religions in 1893. You are souls immortal, blessed, free, and eternal. You are not matter, you are spirit. You are not bodies. Matter is your servant. You are not the servant of matter. Why don't we think that? Think something that's bracing and strengthening. You are souls immortal, blessed, free, and eternal. Yeah, right on. 
that's, that's what I want to hear. For those who are initiated, remember the mantra. The mantra is literally the name of God. It has tremendous power, and it can literally change the contents of our minds and the direction our mind's going. Repeat the mantra. Never underestimate the power of the mantra. It is literally the name of God and has all the power within it. The other things that we can do is sort of depends on our temperament. We can think, I'm the Atman. I'm eternal. I am birthless and deathless. Nothing can touch me. We can think, I'm a child of God. I am a child of God. Nothing and no one can ever hurt me because the king of death cannot even touch me. I am a child of God, and they are protecting me at every step. And know that that's the absolute truth. Nowhere that we take a step are we not being protected at every second. We have to remind ourselves that this infinite strength is within us. We have the ability to be able to overcome whatever obstacles that we have, like we've overcome them before. And that will make us stronger, and wiser than we were before. Rather than running from it, we have to face it. Rather than avoiding uncertainty, we have to actually lean into it. Like that tooth when you're a kid, you know how that tooth, you kind of work on your tooth. Same way we lean into that uncertainty and see what it teaches us. It's also helpful, I found, to kind of take a step back and actually identify the fears. You know, often if we're feeling just fearful, we don't want to open the lid on the garbage can because we're afraid if we open the lid and look into it and see what fears are there, that's going to, the boogeyman's going to jump out and get us. But if we actually lift up the lid and look down, it's like, meow. <laughs> it's much less if we actually look at it with that sort of spirit of not, don't condemn ourselves, just look at it. Say, oh, oh, all right, there you are. What were you afraid of? I was afraid of the boulders coming down. Okay, what was that going to do? They were going to come down and they were going to, they were going to destroy everything. Okay, and what was going to happen? I was going to die. Okay, you afraid to, are you afraid to die? No, no, I'm actually not afraid to die. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of pain. How long is the pain going to last? Not, not, not long, actually. What were you, what else were you afraid of? Come on, I'm looking through the garbage here. What else is there? You're afraid you can protect this place. You're afraid you can protect everybody. Could you ever protect this place? Nah. Could you protect everybody? No. Could you even protect your dog? No. All right. All right. Let it go. Let it go. The divine, the Lord, is the only thing that can ever keep this place the way it should be, to keep ourselves the way. We have to simply allow it, the world to happen as it should. The other thing that's really helpful is to remember that this too shall pass. There is this great Sufi poet, Atar, and Atar told this story about the great Persian ruler and this Persian ruler assembled all the wise men to, into his kingdom and said, I want you to create a ring for me that will make me happy when I am sad. They said, okay. And they went off and they conferred among themselves and a week later they came back to him and they gave him a very simple gold ring. And on the ring it said, this too shall pass. And it worked. So when he was really miserable, he looked and he said, ah, this too shall pass. But it also had the opposite effect. When he was really happy, he looked at the ring and said, oh, this too shall pass. <laughs> and that's the way it is. <laughs> We're living in the relative world, what we call maya. Maya is the relative world. It's the pairs of opposites. For every joy that we have, there will be sorrow. Happiness will mean unhappiness. For every joy, there's sorrow. For every victory, there's a defeat. For every cold, there's some hot. For every pleasure, there is pain. Victory, in the hands of victory, is always defeat. 
The Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, talks about this quiet, quite a bit. For every beautiful day, there's a lousy day or a perfectly dangerous day. We just know that when we get one side, we're going to get the others. They call this, again, the dvandvas, the pairs of opposites. Swami Swahananda never tired of saying, we have good food because there is bad food. Without bad food, there would not be good food. Okay, great. <laughs> but as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, the real us, our deepest inner core, is totally unaffected by it. Pleasure and pain, heat and cold, joy and sorrow, life and death. The Atman within us, the only real me there is, the only thing that is eternal, is unborn, undying, never ceasing, never beginning, birthless, deathless, unchanging forever. It can never die the death of the body. That is what we have to remember. The Gita then tells us to do something really difficult, which is to treat pleasure and pain, loss and defeat, and victory the same. To be unaffected. So we should be the same in pleasure and pain, the, the same in defeat and victory. That's a tall order. But... What we can at least try to do is remember not to be so elated in joy that when we come down to a normal state that we will feel like, oh, no, I'm so, I'm so depressed now. I'm, or that when we go down, when we have a severe downturn in our life, that we can't get back up. By keeping this balance, we are able to not lose our center. We keep a balance in our life. We remember that everything, this too, shall pass. Everything that come up will go down, including our minds, including our bodies. Everything has a, in this relative world, there's both pleasure and pain, life and death, joy and sorrow. So when something really difficult happens, what actually can we do? Well, first, we can remember our eternal divine nature. Remember that everything that changes around us, including our bodies and mind, including everything in this external world, does not affect the real me, the Atman. And that's the only me that counts. Because that me is one with the infinite divine reality, Brahman. That can never change. And that's totally unaffected by all that. The other thing we can do is to remember the most difficult words that have ever been said. Thy will be done. Toughest sentence in the world. Every day here in the temple, every morning, both the temple and the shrine, we repeat, we repeat the prayer of Sri Chaitanya, which says at the end of it, Do with me what thou wilt. Do with me what you want. For thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. Ouch. The truth is, in this world, we have nothing but the Lord to call our own. Even in our everything else disappears, everything else goes away, but the Lord never goes away because that's who we are. It's our eternal divine nature. All of our little loves, all of our loves, our whole life, we've never loved anything but the Lord. The Lord residing within that person, we thought we loved that person for that. We loved nothing but the Lord the entire time. There's a whole section of Upanishad devoted to that, the Brihadaranyaka. The wife loves the husband not for the sake of the husband, but the divine dwelling within the husband. The husband loves the wife not for the sake of the wife, but for the divine dwelling within the, in the wife. This whole laundry list of who we love and our loves, all of our big and little loves, we've loved nothing but the Lord the whole time. That is what's been calling us our whole life. This incredible love that never disappears, that never grows stale, that never sours on us. Sri Ramakrishna said, all, everything, depends on God's will. Really? Even with that? Even with the mountains? Even with the illness? Even with, yes, it all depends on God's will. You know, as they say in AA, we got to let go and let God. Accept the things we cannot change. You know, there's a poem I like that used to be really popular. It's called Desiderata. In it, it says, You are a child of the universe. 
no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Living with uncertainty reminds us that everything is fragile and changing and fleeting and uncertain, except for the one thing that is absolutely certain and unchanging and unfleeting, and that is our divine nature. That which is never changes, that which is absolutely certain, that which we can always depend on because it's who we are. Always have been, have, always will be, and nothing and no one can ever take that away from us, our own divine nature. The only changing, unchanging things is the Lord, the Divine Mother. The Divine Mother holds us in her arms the whole time. We're being held and taken care of exactly the way that we should be held. If a baby is in the arms of the mother, what's uncertainty? A baby isn't worried about uncertainty. It's like, I'm taken care of. We have to sort of adopt that attitude if it works for us. Swami Vivekananda said, Stick to God. Who cares what comes to the body? Through the tears of evil, say, My God, my love. Through the pangs of death, say, My God, my love. Through all the evils under the sun, say, My God, my love. You are here, I see you. You are with me, I feel your presence. I am yours, take me. I am not the world's, but yours. Leave me not. The Lord will never leave us. We can't lose our divine inheritance because that's who we are. You know, they say there are three things, three things that cannot be hidden for long. The first is the sun, the second is the moon, and the third is the truth. And the greatest truth is that our real nature is divine. And we will eventually manifest that and nothing will ever be able to take that away from us. When we hold on to that great truth that our real nature is divine and so is every being that we see around us, we will have with us everything we can ever need. Thank you. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnam Utachate Purnasya Purnamataya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Om Filled with Brahman are the things we see. Filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman flows all that is. From Brahman flows all, yet is Brahman still the same. Om, peace, peace, peace be unto us all. <laughs>